Stressors will make you a better human being down the road. So, you're welcome. Thank me in five years. Hey, I got an email like a like probably. I don't know, maybe it was September. Girl, I think she sat in, in Sasha's seat. Had better handwriting than Sasha though. Um, <laughs> thanked me for her TWAs because that helped her on her GREs, and now she's going on to defend her thesis. Okay. I don't know what a GRE is. It's a graduate school. It's it's like the SAT of the. It's Greek. It's like the uh, the SAT of master's programs and all that kind of stuff. But I guess there was a writing component. I don't know, Mrs. Gaines, I think you can talk to her about I don't, I don't really know a lot. But she thanked me for it, you know, all these like years. Like with a handwritten note? From her phone. Okay. About that. Who knew? My dad got his master's degree at Penn. Yeah, I and feel like the Ivy League school is better than calling him, call, call like, that trash. Which, I'm not calling it trash, but like, what did it lead to? I mean, was he like, did he like invent something with that? Yeah, he just went out and like, there you go. Yeah, see that. Here. I'm like, this is what we're using today. Like, this. okay, so let's see here. What, what is your dad up doing? A lot of things. Okay, but like. What did somebody do? Like if you if you describe his profession, like what would it be? Uh, double double career. First first career was he was a minister, so he went to seminary. While he was at seminary, he went to Penn to get his master's in medieval literature because why not? <laughs> that and then post post pastor, he then became college professor after he got his doctorate. He actually changed his degree. Needed the master's to get the doctorate. Teaching medieval literature. And he was a So your dad had a master's in medieval literature. Mm -hmm. Didn't know so how can you become a college professor, Brady? That's what that's what yeah. that comes from. But like he got the master's degree for fun. Because <laughs> yeah. if you were in Philadelphia if you were in a seminary in Philadelphia, you could go to Penn for free. So it was like <laughs> I would assume somebody who was a Philadelphia seminary is not going to be a Philadelphia All right, so um, the, there's actually sun outside, so I don't want to close the blinds, but I know it kind of makes the pictures up here a little a little hazy and, and tough to see. Um, Take a look at, at what's going on in Birmingham now within the context of the letter from Birmingham Jail. You know, obviously we got a picture of Martin Luther King here. Um, and then what, what's next to it are pictures that kind of become synonymous with the protests that were taking place um, in, uh, in Birmingham at the time. Come on, remote batteries, you can do it. There you go. Um, with the uh, picture here in the middle, um, you have protesters, you have police, and then you also have... Have dogs. You have dogs. You have attack dogs that are getting utilized. So um, with the canines being used here, and then also you have protesters who are being pelted with water from the uh, from the fire hydrants from the high pressure hoses. <laughs> These two become pictures that are pretty synonymous with the uh, the protests that are going on in Birmingham. Birmingham in 1963 is not a, uh, a good place to be, and that's kind of like where notes are going to pick up here. I want to put in some lines, though, so that I can actually write straight. Birmingham, 1963. Uh, Birmingham has a nickname that plays off of Birmingham, and it's not a pleasant one. It's also referred to as Bombingham. And the reason being is that there are 50 
plus bombings that are unsolved, and some would argue, are they really looked into? There's 50 plus bombings that are taking place in, in Birmingham between 1945 and 1962, um, you know, which 17, 18 year period, that's a lot of bombings that, that are occurring. Um, some are deadly, you know, where you do have death counts that, that are taking place. You have bombings that could be taking place in um, hotels. You have bombings that are happening in churches or other places of worship. You have bombings that are occurring in residential areas. Um, you also have bombings that are taking place in businesses. Uh, so there's a lot of people that are certainly kind of dealing with the effects that, that are taking place. 1963, Martin Luther King refers to Birmingham as the most segregated city or the most racially divided city within the United States. Um, King is not from Birmingham. Anyone know where his home base is? Is he tells me a letter from Birmingham jail? He's in Atlanta. Um, and so things are bad enough in Birmingham that he decides to come to Birmingham to try to help with the, the movement, the Birmingham campaign. The local folks have, have started to organize. When, when he shows up, and, and in 1963, you know, the name Martin Luther King Jr. certainly means something. When he shows up, it's not all pleasantries that are happening. Um, some folks within the African American community don't want him to kind of take over. Um, and you also certainly have a lot of people, uh, um, whites within the city, city leaders and contributors that aren't happy that he's here because he's going to be drawing more attention to the problems that are taking place in Birmingham. Uh, he... Uh, when he comes, um, certainly he is, is well known at this point. The idea that he wants to implement, and it's already certainly being done at this point, is what kind of protests do we associate with Martin Luther King Jr.? Nonviolent, peaceful protests. So with the Birmingham campaign, and it's not that they weren't doing this already, but it's, a, it's an extra kind of entity um, that is imploring people not to take a violent approach because certainly with everything that's happening it, it would be potential to do so. Nonviolent protests, what kind of protests could that include when you think of like nonviolence? Like okay, so you have sit-ins and there are famous pictures you know from over the years of this happening where you have sit-ins that would be happening at like diners, uh, you know at the counters and things like that that may only serve whites um, and so African Americans come and sit down. So sit-ins is going to be one. You have marching. You have you know civil protests that are taking place. Um, public assemblies, assembly protests. I would imagine with some of the uh, political leaders that are in the city today, there are going to be some protests that are taking place. Um, and another one that was pretty common, uh, similar to sit-ins, and it has ins in it. It's not a sit-in. It's, it's not a stand-in. Stand it's Not an Eden. Park. Kneel-ins, which would be happening at churches. So you got a mix of approaches, you know, that are certainly kind of taking place here. Um, the reason for the Birmingham campaign is, and again, that's the phrase that gets used with this in, in the 1960s, there's quite a few goals that they are trying to establish. The hope for the goals, number one, is to desegregate schools. What was that term that got used with uh, Brown versus Board of Education too? You have to desegregate the schools with deliberate, deliberate speed. So in 1963, it's not deliberate enough, you know, in, in Birmingham. So we're hoping to de desegregate schools. We're hoping to also desegregate downtown, meaning that you don't have um, separate uh, shops for whites or blacks. You don't have separate restaurants. Um, you know, all public institutions or public places would be open to both uh, whites and African Americans. also want to have fair hiring practices. You do not have any black police officers. You do not have any black firefighters. In downtown, you don't have any black bank tellers. You don't have any black sales clerks or salespeople. You don't have any black cashiers. If you are a secretary, you have to work for um, a, a, an African-American boss. So your job opportunities are fairly limited 
The only thing that you're going to be able to do outside of a black neighborhood that's going to have its own stores and restaurants and, and grocery stores and all those kinds of things would be manual labor, um, maintenance kind of positions and things like that. And certainly at that point, even if you do get hired um, you know, by a non-African American business leader, the wages certainly aren't, aren't going to be the same. So there's the hope to kind of have fair hiring practices so there's more economic opportunity development for African Americans. Also want to increase, what do you think, within the city for African Americans? They have the right to it. Increase voter registration. So that you can have more of a say. And with that, the hope would be by doing these things, by having this desegregation take place, the fair hiring practices, increasing voter um, registration, that there'll also be increased involvement in civic decisions. So, you know, committees and all of that kind of stuff that would include, you know, working with political leaders, there would be increased participation from community members, um, whether it be, you know, African American, um, white, even male, female, and things like that. So because of these lack of opportunities, not only is it going to be these two things that are taking place, but you're essentially trying to get a voice that's going to come through for folks. Um, the main form of method that ends up taking place is there is going to be the right to protest. Uh, so when it comes to protest, there are sustained, organized marches that are going on all throughout the spring of uh, 1963. So in the spring, we have marches, invisible marches, but you know, marches done the same. The marches that are taking place, most of the people who are participating in them are adults. However, adults can't always make the marches. So what other group of people gets involved with the marches? You have adults and you have children. This could be, and really students kind of ends up becoming the word as opposed to children. It could be college age students. It could be high school age students, increasing leadership for the youth of America. Um, and in some cases, it does end up even being middle school and elementary. This ends up being, um, you have these marches for adults, but also children, and they refer to them as the children crusades, where you have kind of mixed reviews that are taking place. Some people are all for it. Some folks also kind of have concerns because you are putting potentially children in harm's way. It's not that the marches are intended to be violent, but if you have people who are against, you know, the, the, the arguments of the people marching, certainly it's a possibility for violence to ensue. So with these marches, you do have both, as we said, adults and then the children's crusade taking place. Um, in... April, on specifically April the 10th, 1963, um, there is a court-ordered injunction that bars or prevents public demonstrations. demonstrations. Basically, you need to, you cannot parade without a permit. Um, the police chief, Bull O'Connor, announces this, again, April 10th, 1963, court-ordered injunction that people cannot assemble. Um, initially, or not initially, obviously this is going to have some backlash because the right to assemble is a it's a constitutional right. It's part of the Bill of Rights. It's within the very First Amendment. So you have the uh, freedom of speech, which, Ryan, does not mean you can say whatever you want. I'm sure you'll talk about that in Law and Justice if you haven't already. Yeah. Um, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and also the right to assemble. Uh, in a lot of cases, and even in today's world, you may need to you know, notify authorities that you are planning a protest just because the sheer number of people that could be partaking in, in such events. Um, but in 1963, in, in April, it's basically announced you're not going to be able to protest no matter what. doesn't matter who you go through, what kind of you know, credentials you have, protest is not going to be allowed. So certainly this becomes an issue with uh, 
um, with the First Amendment rights. So if you tell someone, whether an adult or a child, no, you cannot do this, what becomes the result? Let's do this. Uh, so on April the 12th, No, not really. Yeah. Martin Luther King and 49 protesters are arrested. And they are arrested for parading without a permit. Um, this is something that they certainly knew was going to happen. So it is not a shock. It's not like a violent eruption is taking place. They assemble, start to protest. They know they're going to be taken away. One of the things that also happened with this is not only are you immediately going to be arrested if you are parading without a permit, at the time, the bail money to get out of jail would be $200, you know, for a bond, but that changes where we're going to raise that to $1,500. Um, $1,500 for you folks is a significant amount of money. If I got a bill in the mail for $1,500 and I wasn't expecting it, that's a significant amount of money for me as well. That would equate to roughly probably $10,000 in today's day and age. So if you are, and most of the protesters are going to be African American, if you have people who are not given the opportunity to, for fair hiring practices to have white collar jobs or having equal pay even with blue collar jobs, that $10,000 or that $1,500 for 1963 is going to be fairly tough to come by. Um, so it's certainly a financial deterrent to try to prevent people from protesting. But Paige is right. They wasted no time. Within two days, um, you end up uh, having this protest take place. This is a Friday. I want to guess what day it is on the religious calendar. It's not Easter, because Easter is going to be on Sunday, but it is Good Friday. So, and, and I'm not sure, you know, if that is timing or if that was part of the reason that we're going to do this on Friday, Paige, with you saying wasting no time, that we're going to take a very well-known religious leader um, who is viewed as a rabble rouser by authorities and is going to have him, um, you know, arrested along with 49 other people on Good Friday if they're going for some symbolic value, you know, kind of with it. Uh, I don't know if that was purposeful that, hey, let's do it on Friday for that statement to happen. Um, but King ends up going to jail. He is placed in solitary confinement. Uh, he does not have open access to lawyers or anything like that. He is in jail from April the 20th or from April the 12th through April the 20th. He is freed um, because his release is ordered by... Anyone want to take a guess? President. Finish it off. Kennedy. Kennedy. So JFK is president at the time, John F. Kennedy. So his release is ordered by JFK. Um, that you have to get him out of solitary confinement, but you also have to like simply release him from prison. You can't, you can't keep him in there. Now, this doesn't mean that everyone else automatically is coming out of prison as well. But when he is in prison is when he's doing a letter from Birmingham jail. He's writing it on scraps of paper. One of the... Uh, uh, I don't want to say myth, one of the legends or the beliefs is the janitors provide him with like scraps of newspaper and paper that he can write on. Eventually he's, he is able to talk to legal team attorneys um, from the uh, Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference that uh, he gets a legal pad that he can write on. But his letter from Birmingham Jail, keep in mind, is a letter to fellow clergy members. Um, when, shortly after he arrives, there is a letter that is put in the newspaper signed by clergy members who are Protestant, who are Catholic, who are all Jew Jewish religious leaders as well, basically denouncing his presence in Birmingham, that, that he's causing too much agitation, there's too much stuff going on, you'd be better off if you weren't here. So he does his letter from Birmingham jail, essentially to explain why I have to be here, why it's appropriate for me to be here, and hey, I'm in prison for eight days, I may as well spend some time you know, trying to write this out, for actually about nine days. So um, that release is ordered by JFK, but that does not stop the protest from taking place. It's not that once he comes out, people go, okay, uh, we're going to desegregate everything in Birmingham. It continues to go on and on and on and on. In total, with all the protests, you're taking a look at approximately 2,500 protesters are jailed. So if you have an unjust government, 
what must a just man do? Fight the government and go to jail. So 2,500 people go to jail. This causes a problem, because now what's going to be going on? It's a crowded jail, okay? And this all kind of comes to a head on May 7th. Um, the, on, on May 7th, 1963, in the Birmingham jail, it takes four hours to serve breakfast, which, you know, we wouldn't go, oh my goodness, that's a crisis, but it simply kind of accentuates how many people are in there, how much this is being disruptive to everyday life that would be going on. And it's not that there's only 2,500 protesters in jail, but there's the other people who would be there as well. Um, with the protesters, on May 3rd, is when the canines, the fire hoses are started to be used on people. So this is drawing attention to the tactics that the police department is using. Um, because you do have canines being used and fire hoses, now you do start to have more violent protests taking place where people are going to be throwing rocks, you know, and things like that um, at, uh, at, at police officers and just people who happen to be in there. So the peaceful protests are becoming more violent in nature, which is something that a lot of uh, critics at the time put that blame on King. Kind of like how last year or yesterday we talked about that lost school year or 1958, the fact that schools are, are taken away from people, a lot of blame goes on to African Americans as scapegoats. A lot of attention is being placed on look at the violent disturbance, look at what's happening with our jails, and the problem is we have all these people, so it must be their fault for protesting. And that's going to be a point that uh, King does a little bit of a counter-argument for in Birmingham jail. Towards the end of Letter from Birmingham Jail, he also really becomes very critical of the clergy members um, for some of their comments towards the police force. So those would be some things to kind of focus on, look at how he does this counter-argument, sets it up, and what his criticism of those clergy members would be. Keep in mind, with these protests that are happening on you know, May 3rd, May 4th, May 5th, going all the way through May 7th here, um, is you still do have children involved. So literally there would be cases where you could see a fifth or a sixth grader literally rolling down the street as fire hoses are you know, pushing the water you know, onto him or her. So it, it's really not a, a good scene to see. On May 10th, agreement is reached uh, between African American leaders and city leaders. The mayor is under heavy fire at this point. City council is under heavy fire at this point. Um, Bull O'Connor, the police chief, is under heavy fire at this point. On May the 10th, there is an agreement that they will desegregate downtown Birmingham. And with that, that there will be fair hiring practices, or at the very least, fa fairer hiring practices, and things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, you kind of get a little shock of reality kind of coming back to you. May 10th is when the agreement is reached. On May 11th, take a guess as to what happens based on the city's nickname. There's a bombing that takes place at the Gaston Hotel. Who would be staying at the Gaston Hotel? Martin Luther King Jr. So King is staying at the hotel. He is not present when the bomb goes off. He literally had left like just a couple hours before. Um, but you do have bombings taking place. They continue throughout the, the summer. Um, so while, yes, an agreement does take place, you still do have some effects that are occurring, you know, because of it. Uh, and any time you have, you know, any kind of controversial issues taking place, and even though some kind of peaceful agreement may take place, there's always going to be folks that, that end up looking at it differently. Um, later on in the month, uh, literally a month later, June 11th, the governor of Alabama is George Wallace, um, which historically is one of the more racially charged politicians, did some campaigns to run for president, um, basically based on pro segregation and things like that. If you've ever seen Forrest Gump, there's a moment when Forrest picks up a notebook and hands it to a student. Um, she's going into the University of Alabama, and then they cut to uh, film footage of George Wallace barricading the University of Alabama, where he's refusing to desegregate. So after Birmingham, you still have the governor of Alabama trying to keep segregation alive and not allowing the integration of the uh, University of Alabama to occur. 
Now, again, he's kind of called down. Um, Kennedy sends people in, uh, military presence again, to, to de-escalate that situation. But it's certainly not a, an easy thing that's happening. In, uh, in June, a couple days later, uh, I think it's on June the 13th, but in June of 63, the uh, JFK doesn't sign but proposes and sends to Congress his Civil Rights Act bill. Well, at this point, it would be his Civil Rights Bill. Um, and then this ultimately gets enacted in 1964 is when it passes and goes into, um, becomes enacted and goes into, uh, in, into you know, effect. Um, at this point, when it does pass, Kennedy is no longer president due to assassination, so Lyndon B. Johnson is president. But 1964, that Civil Rights Act is essentially what basically denies um, segregation to occur anymore. So all those Jim Crow laws that were existing before, after slavery, they're basically kind of called down. But, you know, there's certainly a chain reaction events that are going on with Birmingham. There's a lot of reason for King to be there. So this kind of at least gives you what that, that circumstances or what the... The occasion, the audience would be from a soapstone perspective as to why he's writing the letter from Birmingham Jail. It's a long letter, but he has a lot of stuff to write about that, that's on his mind um, with very good reason. Keep in mind his audience, clergy members. So he goes very heavy with illusions, and most of those illusions tend to be religious ones since that is the audience he's looking at. Um, with that, but so tomorrow we'll do the quiz. Notes, you know, as always, you can certainly.